and start in the recording. Okay, we're ready to go. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Peterborough Select Board meeting for Tuesday, August 4th, 2020. I'm Tyler Ward. I'll be chairing the meeting this evening. With me is Karen Hatcher, fellow Select Board member, and Bill Taylor, another fellow Select Board member. We have Deputy Town Administrator Nicole McStay. We have Town Administrator Rodney Bartlett, and we'll hear from Chief Walker this Come evening. So tonight we'll uh, hear from some members of our, of our uh, subcommittee of the Economic Development Authority regarding affordable housing proposal they've pulled together. Hope Taylor and Peter LaRoche will join us. And then Chief Walker will give us an update on COVID-19. We're all familiar with the process there, but he's back to tell us some more. And then there's a great initiative in town collaborating with Banana Community Hospital for a mask up campaign. We'll have some new business, uh, the 2020 assessment to sales ratio and proposal for partial statistical update. If everybody remembers back in 2018, we had a full revaluation of the town, which brought our levels of assessed values closer to sales values. I believe we'll, we'll discuss, and the town administration has some suggestions uh, on where we should move with that. Tyler, hang on a second. Yeah. Allie's telling me that she's not seeing this on Facebook. Hang on. I see it. One moment. Got three other people watching it as well. I just got a text that we can't find can't find it on the Facebook page. Um Nicole, you're streaming it as Nicole. Oh, that's why. I'm sorry. Let me uh let's start over. That explains it. Hold on. Okay. There we go. Let me try again. There it is. It was just practice anyway. It was. You'd you think I'd have this down by now. There's one little drop down menu that I I obviously just missed. There we go. You putting that in her file, Rodney? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now let's try that again. Oh, yeah. Good. It says it on, on my screen. All right, apologies for that. We had a little te technical difficulties. We are streaming live on Facebook this evening, and if you're seeing us anywhere else... Uh, Wait, hold have... on. Yeah. <laughs> Lost it? Oh, All right, we do not agree to live on Oh, well, there is that delay, right? Hold on. There is a delay. Yeah. Oh. Even showing that they're coming to the broadcast. Hold on, let me look. I don't even dare look at it anymore. there is that delay, right? I can hear me talking in somebody's background. Yeah. I can see it. I can hear me talking in somebody's background. Oh, wait. I'm looking at the wrong page. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> it's not me that told you to stop. It's Allie. It's my fault. And are we ready now? Do you think so, Allie? Well, that's what Hold on. We do want to make, since this is the only avenue for people to see us, we do want to make sure it is live. It appears to be running. I mean, I can see yep. it. So. Yeah. Yep, I can see me in the corner office on here. Yeah, it's working, right, right Allie? All right. Great. Now we're live. Take okay, three. Sounds good. So clearly, if you're seeing us now, you've seen that we've had some tef technical difficulties. We are not available on 
Comcast Channel 22 or Ustream this evening. So they got to, you got to miss it there. Uh, it will be archived though, however, and viewable at a later time. Welcome to the Peterborough Select Board meeting for Tuesday, August 4th, 2020. I'm Tyler Ward. I'll be chairing the meeting this evening. Along with me are fellow Select Board members, Karen Hatcher and Bill Taylor. We also have Town Administrator Rodney Bartlett, Deputy Town Administrator Nicole McStay, and Chief Walker is here with us. This evening's agenda, we'll hear from Hope Taylor and Peter LaRoche from the Affordable Housing Subcommittee of the Economic Development Authority with a proposal for, for some uh, building in town or, or an idea regarding building in the area. Chief Walker is here to update us on COVID-19. There are some new, uh, there's a new avenue with which to find information. And we'll discuss the partnership with Mananak Community Hospital and the Mask Up campaign that is in full effect. Our new business this evening, will discuss uh, 2020 assessments to sales ratio and proposal for partial statistical update. If everyone recalls back in 2018, we had a town revaluation which adjusted assessed values of properties uh, to closer to sales, uh, sales uh, prices and we'll, we'll see what, what's happened in the market since then and how COVID-19 has affected sales or if it hasn't. We have minutes to approve from June 23rd, 2020. And we also have some other business to discuss regarding uh, the state revolving fund and funds for the Stone, uh, not Stone Cold, Steve Austin, the Cold Stone Springs uh, water facility. And there you have it. So, oh. ready to go? Hope we'll be sitting in that chair over there. All right. Just Welcome, Hope. About the cabin. Um, I don't know how much of this, if I were to put it down, they could see it just should They can't see any of it. Okay. Um, this idea uh, needs help from the town. Um, it is a two-pronged idea. It's for affordable housing that would be sustainable. In other words, not using any government subsidies of any sort. Um, the idea is to use a town's um, already owned land that's sitting idle. And once it's done, then the town would start getting taxes on this. Um, we, started call we started calling them humble homes. Um, that name can be changed if we go very far. Anyway, the other prong is the idea that it would be built by local contractors and tradespeople, and um, they would put in their time for nothing and end up owning an asset at the end. So these small contractors or business people, particularly contractors who do dangerous work, you know, if, um, if they got hurt, they would have an asset that they would own ongoing. Um, so we started out with a very simple building um, and then we decided that we needed to get an architect to draw up um, something so that we could then have uh, um, somebody like Peter uh, uh, pr price it. So the first thing we did, we, we used the idea of Evans Flats because there was already um, a big study done on that with the idea of doing housing down there. And this was, it's old, but it's, um, but it was something that people were interested in doing. So uh, Sharon Monahan and I uh, went down and surveyed it to make sure that the wetlands were, you know, weren't encroaching and that there would be room to do this. So the next thing that we did once we had that, so I've got, you know, I've got a Plan that's that big. And then we went and had, so Sharon, Sharon helped with, you know, didn't, didn't ask for anything in turn. We next went to John Catlin, who was working on the townhouse here, and he did some drawings of um, 16 units in four buildings that are quite small. So they're under 625 square feet, but they have two bedrooms each. And um, they fit on the part of the land that's left that 
doesn't run into the wetland buffer zone or anything like that. So um, then we gave those plans to Peter LaRoche and um, he with Beltate's help um, did some uh, pricing. And so now I will have to open up my folder and read. Um, so we have created um, three separate possibilities based on what we've learned so far. One is strictly builder, builder owned, where we we buy the materials with a bridge loan that would last a short period of time and then the buildings would get built. And then after the um, bridge loan was paid off, then we would condoize them and everybody who wanted a unit to own one would get, you know, it would all go that, and we know we're gonna need a lawyer and you know, all that. But anyway, so um, the pricing, if it was materials only, and the labor is all <coughs> given, um, sweat equity, um, the total price on this particular uh, um, drawing that John Catlin did would end up being 850,000, which would be a unit price of 53,000, and with rental income, which is based on something that Palaja and I found out way back in the beginning of, of uh, having started this small affordable housing committee, we talked to NHBB who had come before the EDA complaining about this problem in the first place. And we asked them, what is an entry level job able to pay in rent? And it was anywhere between 750-ish and 850-ish. So we've been trying to stay in those parameters. Um, so that first, that number one uh, proposal would return anybody, whether it was an investor or um, one of the tradespeople, eight and a half percent roughly. If the whole thing were built by investors and there was no sweat equity involved, the price doubles on the same um, uh, drawing on that. So that would come to 1 million seven, and that's 110,000 per unit. And you'd have to charge a higher rent. All of these units, by the way, are exactly the same. There are no differentiations. You know, we started out with studios and one bedrooms and two bedrooms, and it was too complicated. So that would, that would net, the net on that would be um, four and a half percent. And what I'm doing here is I'm taking the gross rents, you know, 750 or 850, whatever it is, times 12, and then cutting it in half because we wouldn't know what the um, taxes would be or what the owner's expenses would be and that kind of thing. So I'm being very conservative. Um, and then the other thing that we decided to present was, and I went up and looked at these, and this is Camelot Homes, or any, um, any prefab, modular, uh, house kits, there are all kinds of, they're everywhere. And I, I picked um, Camelot Homes. We found some that, that, that um, are uh, anywhere from, you know, they run from anywhere from 38,000 each to, um, you know, way beyond what we want to afford. But the idea of this is, whether it's a kit or something that's all in, it cuts down the time that it would take to build and set the whole thing up, which is good for the local tradespeople and so forth. Um, so that would, uh, and also each of these ends up, ha you know, I've put in contingencies, the hookups for the town and all that. So that one, um, the units would end up being 51,000 each based on 44,000 plus hookup fees and whatever else happens to the site. And, um, and that would be a return on investment of 8.7. Now, since we started this about six months ago, um, or actually seven months now, uh, we have found investors who are very interested in this idea. 
who are already doing housing or things like that in town. So we have two. So we might end up, if this flies, um, being half and half. Half and half, you know, sweat equity and, and half being investors who invest ahead of time and therefore there may not have to be a bridge loan or it may not be up to as big. Um, one of the things that I want to say before I forget is if this is either may fly or it's going to be in the paper tomorrow, I'm, I've been very concerned about the abutters all along. I want to make sure that if any, if this goes beyond this meeting, that I or somebody gets to them and, and you know, talks to them. Um, I think I better stop now. <laughs> If anybody has any questions. I do hope, but I think Tyler may have gotten popped off. Oh, hold on. Huh? Is Tyler on? Tyler is not on. He had it, the power flickered and he lost his internet. So he's right. working on coming back up. So Hope, I, I just want to, so thank you. Thanks for um, taking the initiative and for, uh, I know you have been doggedly working toward affordable housing. Uh, as part of the committee with EDA. And I really appreciate it. Um, I'm just questioning, I wanna understand how, what the, what the part of the town's piece of this is, because I know we own the property, um, but how, how is the, is it a housing trust? Is, it a, is there a management piece of this where the monies get paid back through rent? And so there's a mechanism where someone's managing that. Um, yes. What, what are you thinking? There would, there would eventually, we, obviously if, well, okay, the first, the answer to the first question is the fact that we, we broke this down into three possibilities. Um, the ones that, that are the least expensive gives us room to negotiate with the town some sort of payment for the land or some way that we can go back and forth, you know, maybe we pay so much and you forgive the hookups or, you know, something like that. And we also realized that we would have to have a lawyer pretty quickly if, if this was considered a good idea to, we would end up, it would just be investors or the tradespeople owning the units. And it would be just like any other condo association, you know, just like Governor Square or Colonial Square, they, we would set up a, a committee that would be, that would run it. Okay, thank you. Yep. So the, so the investment the town is making is the, is the land, and maybe that gets paid for in part, maybe there's an, a sharing that comes back or something. So we could, we would just, we would negotiate a price and and go from there. Um, okay. I wasn't sure about how that would work. Bill, do you want to jump? Um, you know? I don't, in other words, how, what the legal things that you have to do. I mean, if we negotiate a price for that particular land and it's such and such, I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Do, what do you have to do from there? Is it, does it have to be advertised or? I don't know. Okay. There's there certainly a lot of things that would have to happen first. One of the issues is that for the town to do anything with a piece of property that it owns, you need to go through a 4114A process, which mm -hmm. requires that the select board hold two public hearings. Mm -hmm. um, there may be other people who might be interested in, a, in putting forward a proposal for the use of that property as well. Um, there have been some interest, there has been some interest expressed in the past, so no one's actually come forward with any plan. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah, what's, what the select board has done in the past, um, most recently with the GAR hall, is put out uh, requests for proposals before uh, even starting the 4114A process um, to see what other ideas might be out there. So, if the board uh, is interested in moving forward with um, doing a project on Evans Road on that property, um, that might be a model that you want to take some time to look at and see if that still makes sense. Well, um, I remember that, and I remember the, that 
at one point the town was going to do something with somebody for a dollar or something. And then something else, then the post and beam ended up there, but there was a price set on it. And then I think the town had to offer it at that price. As I would say, yeah, that was a, a different process. That was because the uh, GAR hall had been donated to, to, to the town and there were restrictions on the property. It had to be used towards a, um, I'm trying to remember what the exact wording was in Rodney, if you got it on the top of your head. <laughs> um, but my, if memory serves, it had to be used as a park or a memorial or something along those lines. And so the town to fulfill that uh, donation, that gift bequest, they had to uh, put the put the property out for sale at at for the value of the property, whatever that assessed value was. Right. Is that about right, Rodney? That is correct. Okay. And that's just because of uses and what the people that gave it originally wanted it to. Yes. Precisely. Yeah. So it's the, be the same, really. Well, I, we'd have to look into how the town acquired that property on Evans Road in the first place. Um, there was a deed restriction on the GAR Hall property. They may not be one on this property. Okay. So. Can you help me with that? I, that's up to the select board. Oh, well, I, yes. But I mean, one, yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. I have a question. You can hear me. Who is that? Peter LaRoche. Hi, Peter. Hi, Peter. Hard to hear you. I, if the town, if we <clears throat> went through with this and we paid full market value, my question would be: Would the town be willing to possibly willing to give, you know, the sewer and water hiccup, hiccup, hitch ups at a lower rate? Maybe have the tax rep, tax bill reduced for like ten years, as long as it's encumbered for, you know, ten or fifteen years, whatever. whatever it's <clears throat> I, from my perspective, I think that gets us into the weeds pretty deeply. Uh, I, you know, tonight sounds like what we're looking for is a, a, you know, a general feeling from the board as to whether or not we think, you know, use like this on that property is a good idea and whether we would want to go forward with a, a process of a hearing or something like that. Does that sound right, Tyler or Bill? Yeah, well, see that? Oh, I just slid back into the meeting. There. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, Pete, to address Peter's question, or, I would say all options are on the table from this point. I mean, if we work out something that adds 16 units of low-income housing to the town, then it's a good thing. And, you know, once the proposal goes out, are the, what was it, 41A14? It's 4114A, yeah. That was awful close. So it's <laughs> pretty good. A lot of ones. So once we get into that process, you know, proposals are going to come in, and we're going to weigh the best option for the town. Period. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. But I think you know the we've all done some work with housing over the last year, and we all recognize the need for affordable workforce housing, and um, you know, so having any proposal to look at is really exciting and um so i'm willing for us to kind of see how to go forward did you catch any of that tyler i missed uh, most of that yeah sorry about that <laughs> the lights flickered oh. and, and and i lost my internet there but uh it sounds like sure this is this is definitely a good discussion to start and and let's see what we can work with as you know as a town and we've we've considered another project similar where uh you know, certain town land could be used, right? So let's um, let's think about it. But yeah, no, I don't. I wouldn't make a decision tonight, especially not after missing most of the discussion. <laughs> it's understandable. But for, for Peter, this I mean, like, yes, the town would consider anything. I mean, of course, we'll consider right. anything. They're not going to rule out any type of, you know. Right. partnership or whatever just for the sake of rolling it out and it'd be good to hear from the public with more information you know when they have more information too right right yeah, well i have more information it's just that you can't see it tonight i have maps yeah. graphs you know yeah layouts, I, think, drawings. I think hope our our process though is one we have what we need to do is decide on the process that we want to kind of go through if this is if the public hearing is the the way to do this, the 4114A or whatever, um, 
you know, that should be a discussion we have and then we can uh, figure out next steps. May I ask a question of Nicole? Hmm. What is, is that a state thing? What exactly is that? And what does the process entail and what do you need sure. from us to do it? 4114A is a state law, RSA 4114A, and that covers how towns can acquire property and how towns can sell property. So they have to go through uh, a double public hearing process. You have to hold two public hearings. They have to be spaced a certain number of days apart um, before the select board can make any decision about property. Okay. And if I could add to that, it also requires a uh, review and input from the planning board and the conservation yep. committee. And the oh, conservation, board. that's correct. Yep. Sorry, I forgot about that part. So we know so. we have to go before the planning board. No, it's not time. just that. They have to weigh in on the project in the first yep. Right. So is the is the first part to have a full plan, you know, kind of presented, or is it just concept, or what is it that that hopes group would need to to bring to us? How complete does it need to be to to move a process forward? That's well, really going to depend. What Sorry. she has is pretty complete. It's just she we can't hold it up and have you see it. So what we need to do is figure out a way where the Tyler, Karen, and I can all look at it. You know, okay. Have it laid out somewhere here just where we can around a big table. We can all have masks on and stand six feet apart. But if if you could see everything we've done it so far, it would be very clear. Okay. Sure. I, I missed part of that. I, I heard 16 units, roughly 55,000 per uh, would, and I don't know what, if I miss, was there, is there buy-in from 16 contractors that would work on this for the, for a year without a salary to, to, uh, to, to do this? How does this work? They would, they would spend as much time as they could while they're still earning their money the rest of the week, maybe put in three days a week. I've got that all figured out. You know, it's all in the return that any investor or themselves would get. And the idea is that <clears throat> we would end up give, um, uh, having, having some decent, nice housing for 16 people or families. The town would end up starting to get taxes on land that's been sitting idle. And these investors, whether it be the trade people, you know, the contractors like Peter, who I assume is still listening up there, um, would end up owning some if they want and have, end up having some, an asset as they go forward into retirement. I mean, it's like this win, 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 win. <laughs> right, but none of that's our problem to deal with. Right, but right. it's just to give you an idea, he asked how it works. Yeah, yeah. got it. All right, we do have a couple of questions and comments on Facebook. I don't know if you want to take those, Tyler. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, well, Carol I, Nelson. I don't, I can't see them, so I'm, yes. but sure. Uh, Carol Nelson asks, so if there are 10 local builders, then would there be 10 owners? It sounds rather cumbersome. Yes. Or, or there's a formula that I figured out that depending upon how many hours a different contractor or tradesperson, you know, we need roughly for that many units in those buildings that we have drawings to show you, um, we would need at least three contractors, one electrician, one heating and uh, plumbing person, and what's the other? But, but that would be for their partnership to decide. Right, so, and then we have, which Tyler, this is an important aspect that came sort of along our last six or seven months of working on this. We mm -hmm. have two very important investors who are interested in this, who already own um, or need more affordable housing. So it could be two, it could be part and part. Okay. And also, if I might add, the units are around 600, 620 square feet. Right. And they're small so to be affordable. And which will help to keep them affordable. The, that's also a legal question where if we get further than this, we'll have to get a lawyer and work out all the, you know, after Nicole gets past or, you know, we get past the or whatever it was. Um, we know that there's a lot of other work to be done, but we've worked out roughly how, how they can stay affordable so that people don't, the owners don't put them, you know, all those kinds of issues we've worked into. 
Am I missing uh, anything, Peter? I think you got it all. <laughs> okay. Hold on. Bill Kennedy asked if Evans Flat properties in the greater downtown TIF district. Uh, it's a good question. I'm not entirely sure. We'd have to Are look that one up. Said no. no, it's not. Okay. Yes. The, yes, the answer is no. No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be confusing. Let's see. The verbal is that answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen Graves comments, not sure how this brings us more affordable apartments near the downtown. Um, it is more or less in our downtown area. It's, the land is located off of Evans Road, which is right off of Elm Street. Um, if you were to drive down Elm Street, you'd see the entrance of the road right next to Scott Farrar. And Hope, you said 750 to $850 a month is the projected. Yes. Rate. Yep. I mean, if we go that route, I mean, whatever route that we've just discussed amongst ourselves so far will be new housing. Right. And, and so that's pretty good. And, um, yep. Yep. and it's definitely within the affordable rental range. It is. Uh, Carol Nelson. I'm sorry. Does that answer that person's question? Yes, I believe so. Yeah. Carol Nelson asked if uh, you're referring to the area where the town puts the overflow of snow in the winter. No. It is that. Yes, it is. Yes. It is that land at the end of Evans Road. Right. Once we, uh, once highway runs out of room on the uh, where the highway garage is, then they use that area off of Evans Road uh, as the snow dump. And up until fairly recently, the town used to dump pipes and all kinds of stuff down here, but it's all cleaned up now. Uh, most of that material was used on the Union Street projects. Oh, okay. Where would the snow go? We're not having that anymore. <laughs> oh, <laughs> we decided that while you were. <laughs> While you are disconnected, it's not going to be any more. One of our cost-saving measures. <laughs> if if a select board were to decide to do something with this parcel, we could certainly find other town land to, to store snow on. It wouldn't be that that difficult. It might not be as convenient to the downtown, but right. And just to be clear, everybody that's worked on this are volunteers. No Absolutely. one has a vested interest in this. Uh... Nope. Right, because we will get those questions. Who's going to benefit from this financially and that sort of thing? So, right. No, so far, I want to say Sharon Monahan has helped, John Catlin, and Peter LaRoche, and Bill Bates. Right. Sasha Doobie's asked, What is the deal with the abandoned building on Elm Street in 101? Why is it just rotting? Um, the property owners have chosen not to do anything with the building. And I believe that's all the questions. All right. Well, interesting proposal and certainly a lot to think about and discuss. And, and we'll look forward to setting up something where we can view it and properly discuss it, right, as a board and town administration. OK, so I, I don't need to do anything yet until I hear from you guys and just bring in and spread it all out. Thank you very right. much for your consideration. Yeah. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for the work you put into this. This is this is a good step forward if, if something can work out. So yeah, thanks. All right. Well, welcome very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Chief Walker. Let me, let me unmute here. <clears throat> so uh, thank you for inviting me back, I guess. Um, <laughs> before, before we talk about COVID, just a quick little update. Um, Tropical storm Isaias, I think I pronounced that correctly, um, is he headed our way uh, overnight tonight. Uh, at six o'clock, there's actually an updated conference call, but the, the the primary change of the last few days is the track has shifted further west, at least last I heard it was, which for us means less rain, um, but a little more wind. So they are predicting some 25 to 35 mile an hour winds, maybe gusts somewhere in the 40 to 50 mile an hour range and the rain is still around two or three inches and it should be out of here and sunny by tomorrow. So um, internally, the current radar. Yeah. there you go. <laughs> Thank you. Um, where are that little arrow, right? Yeah, there. we're right there with the little arrow. So the storm uh, is like just about past us already. Yeah, 
so the um so internally you know we have we have sort of prep for in terms of dpw police and fire so you know we're, if, if nothing else it was good practice early in the season um to get ready and start you know talking about some of the things that we look at from a community when it comes to these tropical storm events so now back to covid um a couple a couple of things so you know we've been fortunate in the as i said before in the southwestern corner of the state to not be super impacted by coronavirus um, and, and COVID-19. You know, to date, the town of Peterborough has had a total of 18 residents that have tested positive and identified as residents of the town of Peterborough uh, at the time of testing, which although it is higher than, you know, some of our surrounding communities in total number, when you look at the rate, it's not a bad rate. Um, in there. Again, zero would be better, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that it's necessarily acceptable or good, but it, it's, it's not super high. Um, last week in the Daily Dispatch, one of the things that I spoke about and talked about was the new portal that the state has available for um, to be able to see what the local numbers are and so forth. And I don't know, I can't seem to share. I know I was out for a second. Is that... I can, there you go. All right, so let me here. Um, can folks see my screen? Not yet. Not yet. Uh, wait, I have to click the little share button. There we go. There you go. Uh, all right, so if folks can see, if you go to, let me back up here, I apologize. Um, so if you go to the state's COVID page, which is you can just Google uh, New Hampshire COVID data or New Hampshire dot gov slash COVID-19. If you click on the COVID-19 summary dashboard, um, it brings you up here. And sort of the two most interesting map and a lot of great statistics on your total curve and risk are here, but two maps that are interesting. Um, the first one is the map of cumulative positive cases. And you can click on any town in the state. Here I'll grab Peterborough. Um, and you can look, so in Peterborough, we've had a total of 18 positive cases um, since they started this back in March. Um, the other one, which is actually a little more valuable, if you will, in terms of showing what's going on presently, is map of current positive cases. So if you look at the map of current positive cases and come down here again, going back to Peterborough, where we are, um, we have less than four cases. And the total number, the state suppresses the total number is less than four. But if you look around the state, I mean, if you were to look at it from the beginning, it looks like, you know, there's, there's a lot going on. We've, like I said, we've been fortunate um, that the cases, the number of cases has gone down. Like I said, in town here and all the towns around us, um, we have very few cases, um, you know, globally as we're going through there uh, and looking at that. So folks can go and look on that um, and pull that data up for any community um, across the state. And a lot of other states have similar data for that. I know one of the, one of the things to discuss is sort of the idea of masks um, and masking. So Manana Community Hospital is partnering with, starting with the town of Peterborough, and we'll be working out through other towns in a program that's co-sponsored with the New Hampshire Hospital Association called Mask Up. So what Nanana Community Hospital is doing is assisting the communities with a lot of outreach information. I know that the folks here in the town of Peterborough, some volunteers through the um, Economic Development Authority have been working directly with business owners to get this marketing material out. Um, it includes table stands, it includes clings for windows, posters for windows, reminding folks that really wearing masks Washing your hands and social distancing are the best things. Um, particularly, Nicole's going to bring that up. So there we are. Um, so this is the mask. It's the excuse me, the poster, um, co-branded um, with the Manana Community Hospital in the town of Peterborough. Um, one of the things that went on with this also was they had a the Graham and Adnock Rotary Club sponsored a mask up event where they gave out. I don't have the number. I know they had over two thousand cloth masks to give out. Um, free to residents in the area. So they had that. And then there's also, there's an, another set of posters that go along with the idea of masking up and working. I don't know, Karen, from the um, perspective of our EDA, how many, how many folks I know that the 
quite a few members jumped right on board with going and distributing that material. Yeah, I really want to give a shout out to the members of the EDA uh, who could do that. So Bill Kennedy and Jean Deitch and um, Megan Swoco and James Kelly. Um, uh, I think that was the list and, and I was out there too. And we, uh, they each took a big chunk. And so we have about a hundred uh, businesses that we um, are in the process of visiting stopping by to make sure that they have posters. Um, a lot of them, you know, just in the course of going out the other day, um, what I noticed is that they already have signs in the window. They already have mask, big mask signs that signs are, masks are required. Um, so I was really happy to see that. You know, it looks like our businesses have, have already done a lot of this good work. And um, uh, so that was really important to see. And I know that the team is, uh, finishing up this week with the rest of the posters. So if any businesses have not seen one of us yet um, and would like to get your hands on the materials, you can just send an email to me at community at peterboroughnh.gov and uh, I'll be sure to get in touch. So that, so that leads back to sort of this discussion about masks on, and, and if we want to look at something for a mandatory use of masks, you know, there is the there is the, the program we're doing here, the mask up in conjunction with Manana Community Hospital. The governor's reopening orders you know, cover the wearing of masks in most of your business, whether it's retail, restaurant, um, you know, beauty, healthcare, all those avenues have it covered. Um, Nashua very early on did a local ordinance for a mask that was challenged. Um, the challenge was thrown out, or I should say the ordinance was upheld um, by the courts. Since then, a number of municipalities, um, the list that I had today through um, Department of Public Health, the ones they're aware of, Portsmouth, Plymouth, Enfield, Keene, Lebanon, Hanover, and Durham are also looking at uh, mask ordinances. And there may be others too, but those are the ones that we were aware of. And Keene sort of being the closest to us um, as we go forward. So in, in looking at it, a couple of the issues that came up with Keene um, if you look at Keene's website, they have available the packet that went out to the members of their planning, licensing, and development committee. Um, it was on their agenda for their meeting on July 29th. And they looked at this as, uh, and brought it up and went through the, went through the process. And internally, as we looked at it, and also looking at and echoing some of the things that came out of Keene's, two things that came out really were issues around enforcement. Um, and, you know, Chief Steve Russo from the Keene Police Department, you know, was asked to draft a memo, um, you know, in which he talks about, you know, the, the difficulty of the ordinance, not from the fact that, you know, there is a lot of public discontent with it. You look nationally, um, you know, about the, the level of people that are saying, you know, it, it's an overreach, you shouldn't have to wear it to the fact that, you know, any of the, any of the guidance you look at, whether it's CDC or state guidance does provide for certain individuals, particularly those with some health issues are exempt. So, you know, getting into the, how do you enforce this? How does this work? Do, you know, should this person wear a mask, not wear a mask and looking at this um, and going forward, you know, with that. I mean, I think that, you know, to, to quote Chief Russo from the memo, and again, this memo was on Keene's website and looking at it, you know, given public sentiment on both sides of the face coverings issue, any enforcement, especially strict enforcement, may very well lead to undesirable consequences in public perception embracing a lack of public trust. I um, mean, going forward with that. You know, I know from our perspective here in town, we have been very fortunate in, with I think the level of responsibility, if you will, with our businesses with the folks attending our businesses and our restaurants, the folks that are in our public spaces. You know, Karen hinted to that somewhat with her discussion about the number of businesses that already have signs up and, and are enforcing that. We, we've had very few complaints, or I should really say very few questions from the public around, you know, the, the issue of masks um, and getting there. So I don't, you know, I, again, I don't know um, from a perspective, you know, there are half a dozen communities in the state. If you look at that list, we'd be the smallest community looking at this um, from that list and sort of where they are. Um, I can see Karen looks like she's chomping at the bit to throw something in there. I want to just 
just say something about the towns that are on the list, Ed, yeah. and that is that they all have universities or colleges, and they all have students coming back this month uh, to campus. And um, so it makes a lot of sense for those, those particular communities in the state to have an ordinance because students are coming back from all over the country. So that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, you know, it's, uh, and I just wanna, I'll go on record as saying, I think, you know, unless, unless we have a statewide mask ordinance, um, it's really difficult for town to town to, to create, you know, uh, an ordinance and enforce it and, and try and get, you know, people will move, people move from wherever they are town to town, right? It's just difficult. So I think, um, you know, if people, and I've heard from people, you know, why hasn't the town done something? And I would say, if you want masks to be required, then the pressure needs to be on the state um, to create an ordinance, uh, make it required in the state. And then we can certainly go along with that and enforce it. But I just think it's, it's really tricky town to town to try and make this work, especially if we're doing well, then people would argue on the other side saying, well, but we're doing well. So why do we need to do that? And I, it's really tricky. Good point. Bill, you want to add something? Yeah, it, I think that the best way for any sort of enforcement is on the individual level. I mean, it's got to be up to each and every person to wear a mask when you're in public. And if in all those places where they have talked about the ordinance, and particularly the one I've read the most about, probably is King because it's closest. They said that anyone, if a police officer approaches somebody that doesn't have a mask on, they can say, I have a health reason. And the officer can't then ask what that health reason is. So anybody that, you know, is not going to wear a mask anywhere is going to use that. And all we've done is written a piece of paper that mandates that you wear a mask that anybody that doesn't want to has a way out of. Lots of activity with the fire department going by the street here. Oh, we got a bunch of trees and wires down. Nothing serious. At least not on your road. That's good. At least you lose, unless you lose power or internet. I think we just, I, I mean, it, it seems like to me locally that, I mean, I, it's very rare that I catch anybody somewhere without a mask on. And I'm not about to ask any about anybody about it. And I certainly wouldn't want to be in that position if I were a cop or who, I mean, who does that fall on? It's yeah. it really, it's got to be down to personal responsibility. Everybody has to do it on their own. And no, if you're I'm, concerned about being somewhere where somebody doesn't have a mask on, you obviously will. Yeah. Chief. Yes. So, um, I mean, we, we have you, our health officer, who's guiding this and has been right out in front of it. And people, you know, they've been listening to you and the Office of Community Development has been you know, working with businesses. So we, people are being responsible in our town. So we're, you know, select board member wearing his in an office alone. Right. So, I'm right here in this meeting. I'm the only one in this meeting wearing a mask. Right. right. So, I, you know, we're, we're going about it the best we can. And I think we're, we're fortunate to have as few cases as we do. Aaron. It's a question for Ed, because, um, there, um, I saw today someone had a question about having been in one of the stores um, and uh, a chain that the chain had determined that masks were required and yet shoppers were coming in and not wearing a mask. And when a person complained to management, their excuse was that um, it's not enforceable because it's not a statewide mandate. So what's your answer to that? And what should people do if that's what they're encountering? I mean, is there recourse? Is there would you go in and speak with the manager or something or, or or what do you think we ought to do about stuff like that? I mean, we certainly can. The mandate is not for customers. The mandate through the governor's reopening guidance is talks about store employees. Um, I really think it does come down to um, having having a conversation with that and going back to one of the problems. And, you know, um, you know, Bill highlighted something the city manager, uh, Elizabeth Dragon in, you know, Keem brought up is the issues with the enforcement of that and as you, you know, moving from community to community and keeping people informed and looking at that, you know, already several of our larger stores in town here do have chain-wide policies requiring the use of masks. 
But again, it is very difficult. And I'm sure everybody has had an opportunity through, whether it's the nightly news or social media, to see some of the you know, pretty horrific interactions that have gone on between individuals who choose not to wear masks and believe they're exercising an, an ordained right compared to those folks that, you know, are trying to enforce that, whether it be a, you know, a clerk or an, or a manager in, a, in an establishment. So I think for, for folks, if they have issues around um, store employees, people that have direct customer contact in restaurants that are not wearing masks, um, let myself know or let Chief Gennard through the police department know. We do have a, we've, we've developed a formal process for investigating those complaints and looking at those. And then there is guidance through the Department of Public Health as well as the Attorney General's office on how the community follows up with that and enforces that. And when we go, you know, go beyond that, if it is a question to the public, I think this is really where we need to rely on ourselves and those people that are committed to the mask wearing to make sure the signs are out there, make sure there is an element of just trying to educate folks. And if, you know, and I think it was Bill mentioned, if you are in a situation where there are people that, you know, aren't wearing masks or you feel are placing you in an unsafe situation, you know, move away from them. I mean, if, you know, if you're driving down the road and you see a driver who's acting erratically, you pull over and let them pass. Um, you know, I think unfortunately that there's some point where if you can't control the behavior of that individual, then you need to take your own actions to, to try to protect yourself around whatever is going on. Yeah. You know, that may not be the best answer or the answer necessarily people want, but unfortunately we might, we might be there with a lot of this stuff. That's a good answer though, Ed. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's a good answer. All right. Well, I think we've covered it. You think? I think so. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks again, Chief. Any questions? From uh, oh. I believe all the questions that have been asked on Facebook have already been addressed. So, great. Thank you. Great. Uh, and just a reminder: the town of Peterborough has a leash law. With the wind picking up, make sure your dogs are leashed this evening. Uh, moving on to the next mm -hmm. item on the agenda: the 2020 assessment to sales ratio and proposal for partial statistical update. Rodney, Mary Beth Walker has put together a, a letter for us and proposal, and you guys have discussed it at town administration. Uh, yes, uh, myself, Nicole, and Leo have talked about it. Uh, Nicole, can you give us an update? Sure. Um, so we did talk about this. Uh, we have been seeing, as Mary Beth pointed out in her memo, that the, um, I'm sorry, I'm getting a little bit of feedback. Bill, can you turn down the speaker a little bit? Uh, Sorry. How about that? More cowbell. I think yeah. that's, that's better. Probably Thank the you. sirens in the background. Just when I talk, for whatever reason, it's it. I think my microphone's oh, picking it up a little oh. bit. Um, the June twentieth tax receipts um, did really well this year. So just to to keep in mind that. Um, one of the things I wanted to bring up tonight was that tax bills came in um, and tax bills came in at 94, we have a 94% correction collection rate. So we've done very well this year. Um, one of the things that Mary Beth was noting, however, was that um, the, the sales that we've had um, have been significantly higher than the assessed value of the property enough so that she's was a bit concerned about the equalized uh, ratio, which is the percentage that gets, that's, gets applied to our assessments. Um, as we were discussing, though, um, like Rodney said, with Leo, uh, myself, and Rodney, Leo pointed out that the unit sales are down, um, that there have been far fewer homes on the market, um, which, you know, Rodney attributes to the COVID cloud. Um, essentially, the COVID-19 has really put a damper on people wanting to, to move. They're, they really want to stay in place, stay in Peterborough. However, what sales there have been have definitely been above assessments. Um, those that are out on the market are getting snapped up very quickly, mostly by out-of-state buyers. Um, and Leo's thought that this had, that really what we should do is nothing with the assessments for the time being. Leave the, 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 the assessments where they are, hold off on doing a statistical update. It's something that we could revisit next year if we see more sales, but right now, the sales really are, are very few and far between and, and really just wasn't enough to, um, to really be considered a true pattern. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. 
Yeah, that that does seem fair, and certainly, uh, but we also don't want to get caught off cut off uh, guard like like back in 2018 where we did the entire town revaluation and and people were you know caught off guard really because that could it had been such a time uh, since their last since the last revaluation and things jumped so much so uh, that's that's the trade off do you do you creep it up a little bit at a time or or wait but it's understandable if the if the data isn't there to to say it's worth doing the the reval now. Yeah, and I don't think we we really know what we're, how long this uh, COVID cloud, if you will, is that what you called it, Ronnie? COVID COVID cloud. We don't really know how long this is going to last and uh, what the effects of that will be longer term. So I think it really makes sense to wait and see um, to collect the data and see what we've got. Sure. So do we need to make a motion or just a general agreement as to do nothing? I think the general agreement's sufficient. Are we? Did you have anything on that? Could you use it? Motion to do nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so let it be written, so let it not be done. <laughs> All right. Oh, well, that sounds good. Okay. I agree with that from a real estate, you know, that's what I do for work too. So I agree with that uh, completely to hold off. All right. Well, then we'll table that one. Great. Thank, thanks to Mary Beth for doing that work and keeping us apprised of what's happening. Next up, we have uh, authority to borrow for publicly owned systems. This would be the Cold Stone Springs water source. Rodney, you want to tell us a little bit about that? Uh, certainly. Um, the uh, DES State Revolving Fund uh, is, a, is a funding mechanism that many, many communities and cities use. We have been offered from the State Revolving Fund a loan of $4.047 million, the amount of money that was authorized at our town meeting for the Cold Stone Springs project. Uh, the interest rate presently on that uh, loan would be one point. 296 uh, for a 20 year time frame. That offer also comes with a 10% principal forgiveness offer from DES. But that means that the time of the final uh, bond number, 10% of what we borrow will be forgiven. So if we were to borrow 4 million at the time of, of putting the bond in place, we would only be borrowing 3.6 million. Uh, it's an excellent offer. It's better than what we received from USDA Rural Development. Uh, I'm recommending that we go forward with it. But to do that, uh, section of Form 2A, Authority to Borrow, um, particularly Section 1, needs to be adopted by the board. Okay. Sorry, you said 1.29% interest rate? Did yes. I catch that? That's not bad, right? <laughs> That's, I think like at the end of it, that'll be the, the like payment wise. It's, I mean, it's, it's like the equivalent of a $1 million loan payment wise was a six month ago. Right. Six month ago. Pretty much. It's incredible. Great. All right. Well, read that number one. Yeah. I'll make the motion, uh, therefore, be it resolved by this Peterborough Select Board, the governing body of said applicant, as follows, that the person holding the position of town administrator, currently held by Rodney Bartlett, is hereby designated as the authorized representative of the applicant for the purpose of filing an application for a loan in accordance with the New Hampshire Code of Administrative Rules, Chapter ENV-DW1100, furnishing such information, data, disbursements, and documents pertaining to the applicant for a loan as may be required, and otherwise to act as the authorized representative of the applicant in connection with this application, and if such loan be made, is the designated authorized representative of the applicant responsible for furnishing such information, data, and documents pertaining to disbursements for the loan. Motion seconded. All right, any further discussion? This is a good deal not to pass up. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye, Tyler. Aye, Bill. Thank okay. you.
unanimous. Thanks, Rodney. Good work on that. And just as a, a follow-up note, we do have another meeting uh, with the Drinking Water Groundwater Trust Fund Commission on August 10th. Uh, Tana Jaffrey and John Frederick and I will be presenting our final funding scenario to the uh, Trust Fund Commission and asking for all the remaining funding to make the project go forward. So I'll be updating everyone uh, on the 10th as to where we stand with our final funding package. That's great. It's good news. It's good, it's good that uh, the townspeople uh, trusted town administration to get this project going and, and it's an important one for the town. We desperately, well, we will need that water someday. And so when you estimated that, what was the estimated interest rate? When we estimated it and, and actually uh, um, looked at what our principal and interest payments would, would be, yeah. our original estimate was at 4%. Yeah, uh, and we may have uh, downgraded it to 2.5, uh, but my recollection says we went no lower than 3% in our estimates. That's what I'm remembering. Yeah, yeah, I think that's. And cool. then, is it an okay time if we're talking about good news and the interest rate thing to talk about the um, bridge and library loan and interest rate? I uh, believe those numbers were at 1.3 percent. Hmm. At 1.3, 1.37, and they were, they were. We budgeted the the budget for both of those things in the neighborhood of four and a quarter percent. So essentially, on those two loans, saving like what was what were we talking about? Like 130, 140 thousand dollars a year cheaper. Yes. On um, those loan payments. That's just on payments. Right. And they're 15 years instead of 20. That's Le that's Leo Smith, ladies and gentlemen, the magic of Leo Smith. We'll put together a, a compilation of all our updated numbers after we get final approval on our funding on Monday, August 10th. Oh, looks like Tyler and Karen might have lost power or something because they're both. Yeah, I think our generators kicked on, so we may be done for the night. Well, how do we adjourn the meter? Looks like I'm in charge, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Motion to adjourn? Yes. Second. Third. All in favor? Have a good night, everybody. The tropical storm winds. Yeah. Go.